Hello, everyone. The day is Thursday, July 9th, 2020. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. Looks like our numbers are still rising, so that's a, a good thing. I haven't been doing a good job of getting the, the word out, but I appreciate you guys and girls showing up. Thank you very much. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. We'll get to that in a few minutes. I don't have a tremendous amount to cover. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, keep them focused on the slides. I've gotten emails, hey, Dave, I'm like you, I got ADD. It's like, well, I've never been diagnosed other than by my wife, but yeah, I probably have a little ADD. Too many uh, shiny objects in this day and age. If you don't mind, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the charts, and you can ask about as many as you want. Just ask about them one pick at a time. I'm getting quite a few questions on money management lately which which is a good thing and money management is is not sexy but like the old tire pitchman i guess his name i think his name was sam bear used to say you got to have them tires ain't pretty they don't smell good <laughs> but you got to have them well money management same thing it's the tires are trading you got to have it and then i'll make more sense in a few minutes but it's good that as i often say and i said this yesterday in my stock chart show when I'm speaking in person, which hopefully I'll get back to doing at some point in time, but usually 11 people or 10 people or so will show up at the stage and ask a bunch of questions about setups right after I get off the stage. And, and that's fine. And I'm a setup junkie too. But one person and occasionally two will ask a money management question. I think that's bad to bet on who's going to make it as a trade. I'd say it's those one or two. People. I'm getting a lot of questions on how to use a Landry list, and you could use it however you see fit, but I'll give you an idea as to what it is and how I use it and how you should use it or might want to use it and how other people are using it too. And that'll make sense in one second. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. It's all, as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Stealing a line from my buddy Greg Morris. Uh, Bear market updates. Still on my website. I don't, I'm gonna have to change that to bull. I think a few weeks ago, my newsletter I changed bear to bull and uh, the market tank. So that was kind of interesting. All right. The question is how much do you invest in the market? I get this question a lot. Like, how much do you allocate to trading? Back at the market peak, and I showed this slide last week and later. It's actually going to be next week. Last week, I said it was this week, but it's going to be next week. I did a, a mid-year update for StockCharts.com, and I went into a lot more detail on a lot of this stuff. But we had eight long positions coming into this big slide. And I'm going to show you the portfolio in just one second and how invested we were. And then ironically, like I said last week, we got stopped out of a short right as the market began to crack. And that kind of pissed me off, to put it mildly, because that's, stock dropped about 30% along with the overall market. That was trying to supply. So you could see as the market slid, we got knocked out of more and more longs, but we began to short more and more. We finally ended up with zero longs and five shorts. And then we started getting knocked out of those shorts. But fortunately on some of them, not all, but fortunately, but some of them, we were taking partial profits along the way. So the portfolio went from a whole bunch of positions on and a whole bunch of cash allocated to hardly any. And I'll walk you through that in just one second. So if you put the curve in here or plot the number of positions, plus one meaning a long and minus one being a short, and you net them out, you could see at the bottom when we had zero longs, in five shorts. Actually, you'll notice one thing that's kind of cool about this. And it's it's kind of frustrating when you're in the in the in the middle of it. But trend following does eventually catch up with the trend. So we were heavily short at the bottom. And then after the bottom, we were still heavily short and actually still adding shorts because that's what the market was offering. And the market was set up for another leg lower. But obviously that didn't happen. And I'm glad it didn't. And I, as I often say, when we're putting on a bunch of shorts or putting on any shorts, it's like, I'm okay with getting stopped out of all my shorts as long as the market starts going up for a while and I can put a bunch of longs on and make a bunch of money on the long side. 
So the whole thing that I'm trying to talk about here, or point I'm trying to get to, is there's an ebb and flow in the portfolio, and right now we have five longs on and no shorts. Now, this is the current portfolio, and anywhere you see white, we have already taken partial profits off the table. So the position is divided into two loaves, so to speak, a trending loaf and a trading loaf. The trading loaf, we're trying to get a swing trade, and the trending loaf, we're trying to get a longer term trend trade out of. So you can only predict so far in the markets. It's kind of akin to predicting the weather. I'm looking outside now, it's kind of sunny. I don't see any clouds in the sky. So I'm guessing it's probably not gonna rain during this presentation. But if it was cloudy and thundering, I'm thinking, eh, it might just rain. So if you have a strong trend followed by a pullback, there's a pretty good chance, and I can't give you an exact number on that, but probably a 60% chance that that trend's gonna try to resume. Now, I can't tell you if it's going to make it to the initial profit target or not, but if it does, we're gonna take off half our shares and move the stop to break even. I just, my Cajun just flipped up. People are like, you don't sound Cajun, I just said shares. <laughs> Anyway, so the portfolio at the peak, so to speak, was invested at about 35,000. I'm sorry, the portfolio recently, as of last night, was about 35% invested if you're going off the hypothetical 100K account, which this model is based on. So there's $35,000 worth of margin on. Now, just looking at this portfolio, keep in mind there's ebb and flow. We're adding stocks and taking away stocks and hopefully hitting lots and lots of profit targets along the way. So we're putting on positions, taking them off, putting them on, taking them off, and letting that market tell us what to do. And if you rewind a couple of slides, obviously we were heavily long at the top and heavily short at the bottom, and now we're heavily long again. Why? Well, because the market is going up. Anyway, so we are about 35% invested, and if all the stocks at the bottom trigger, then it would be another $40,000 worth of margin on. So we'd have $75,000 in margin on the portfolio. Now, as I'll show you in one second, if you take out the open profits, then you're not quite as heavily invested because you count the profits as part of the portfolio. So instead of on a 100K portfolio, in this case, it'd be $104,000 in change. So anyway, as you can see, everything in white has been taken off. So now you have half the risk on and it begins to free up slots. So if you were to add those back in, it would be an extra 15,000 or so dollars round numbers. And that would bring you up to about 50K. Now, to show you a trading example, here's OCFT, which is uh, one of our bigger winners right now in the portfolio. And there's actual trades that I took in an account that I don't, sometimes I call it my model account, but it's account right about 100K. And I like it because that one particular account, because I can kind of follow the service almost exactly in that account. Sometimes I round up a little bit on the shares. I get a little bit more aggressive than what's in the portfolio, than what's in the suggested portfolio. And it's all for educational purposes only anyway, but I do actually take the trades. That's one question I, I, I get. Do you take all the trades? Yes, I do. I work hard to make sure I follow it as closely as possible. Now I do apply a little discretion Sometimes if I've gotten if I've gotten a little bit aggressive and I probably should only have on 600 shares and I might have on 800 or more in this one account and I look down and see my profits is well over $2,000. I don't look a gift horse in the mouth that I might take profits a little early. I might also apply a little discretion. In fact, I will often apply a little discretion. But anyway, you can see the stock had shot up nicely and then pulled back. It's also a cup of handle. You might notice that. And the entry was here. The initial profit target was here. And you can see that's a snapshot of the trades that I took. And then the trailing stop, we're trailing the stop higher. So we took money off of 
the table. Now, I don't want to get too complex with this, but technically, if you have profits on the trade, you actually have more available margin. But that's a little bit deeper into the weeds than I want to get today. Now, getting back to the peak of the market, if you go in and, by the way, you can go to davelander.com slash archives and look at all of these archives if you can't sleep at night. But it's a it's a very good exercise, if I say so myself, in the wrapping your head around the ebb and flow of the portfolio and, and how we make this work. We go in for a swing trade because we don't know if the market's going to turn into a longer term trend. And the chances of that happening, round numbers, probably is about 30%. So the odds are stacked against us, but the swing trade, I don't have exact odds on that. And, and if I knew exact odds on that, you'd never see my fat ass again because markets aren't normally distributed, meaning they don't adhere to statistics. And people are often asked what they could expect. And it's like, well, if the market trends nicely and goes straight up and we catch a bunch of wild, crazy stocks, you can expect amazing results. But if we if it chops around, then you're gonna be very disappointed so we don't know what the future brings and anybody who claims they do is ludicrous even ludicrous would say it's ludicrous i saw somebody somebody posted the other day i saw a headline i try to avoid the news but i saw a headline some economist says oh it's worse now than it was in the depression we're going to see a 40 percent drop from here it's like uh, you know whatever <laughs> you know one day at a time let's just see what happens Anyway, you could see if you, to see how much margin would be necessary, you could see that the, I think this should have been wrapped over here. But anyway, if you multiply the entry times the amount of shares, that's how much initial margin you had to put up. So in a case like the PGNY down here and everything else that's still in yellow as it was at the top of the market, you would have to put up 250 shares times this amount, but in this case, it'd only be half the shares because half the shares were taken off. Now, if you added up all of that margin, it's like 69K. So on a 100K account, it's like, okay, Dave, you're like 69% invested. Well, the good news is at the peak, there was $19,000 of that was open profits. Now, some people criticize and say, well, Dave, you're counting these closed trades. Well, you can take those out if you want. You just kind of eyeball them and take them out. But I like to show the entire trade. So like a TSCO, for instance, it's scratched out on the remainder. Well, that's not very impressive, making zero, zero on a trade, 0%, zero percent, zero dollars. But you made $1,000 on the swing trade part. So I like to see the whole trade and see each trade to its fruition, good, bad, or indifferent. So if you add in that 19,155, assuming that this was just, there's gonna be some ebb and flow in here, but let's just assume this is the portfolio we set up, then you're really only 58% invested because now your account's worth $119,000 and you've got $69,000 of margin put up. So you can see that as the profits grow, obviously percent invested goes down, and that's obviously a good thing. And it's an ebb and flow. Again, we're putting on, taking off, putting on, taking off. And we rarely get to that 100% number. Now, people ask me about margin. Dave, should I go on margin? Well, if you're new to trading, absolutely not. If you've been doing this for a while, then margin can definitely be helpful. What you could do is use margin while you're making the transition. Let's say you've got on four or five positions and they're nearing the initial profit target and you see another position you like, well, you might go ahead and put that position on even if you have to go into a little bit of margin because you know you're gonna be coming off of the margin soon as those other positions hit the initial profit target. Now, on May 31st, this is what the portfolio looked like. You can see we only had one little short position on 200 shares, okay? So the initial transaction here, 200 shares at 4120 would require $8,290 worth of margin. 
But again, in this particular case, just like the prior example, we do have some profits. So we have 49.42 in profits, 49, I'm sorry, 42.98 in profits. And the margin that would be required on the stock based on where the stop, stock price is would be 49.42. So much less than that 8,290 number. Now it gets a little tricky on the short side, but if you just say how much money you're putting up, so to speak, it's like, okay, well, I had to put up around $8,000 in margin and now I only need about $5,000 in margin to, to maintain that position. So you could argue that you're only 5% invested in. And I know it's kind of smoke and mirrors, but if you add that, profit and you're much less than 5% invested, maybe only about 3 or 4% invested at this particular point in time. And that made a lot of sense because the market was going up and the shorts started stopping out and we were actually eyeing some longs somewhere around here, maybe somewhere in June and started putting on some longs. Now, I know I kind of got tripped up on a lot of that. I think the I'm going to blame it on the markets. I'm a little uh, distracted today, so to speak. But any questions on all that before we get into the Landry List? So I get a lot of questions about the Landry List. The Landry List is a list of stocks I publish every, every day along with my trading service. It's the list that I start off with about 2,000 stocks, give or take. And then I call it down to some interesting ones, which I copy over to my momentum list, which comes from old Landry list, which can be two or 300 stocks. And then from those, I picked the few that I like. And sometimes it's quite a few stocks and sometimes it's not that many. Now, how do you use a Landry list? Now out of the list, I'll pick the stocks that I think have the most potential. Coming into the day, I picked Vary, V-E-R-I and a couple other stocks. And the rest of ones, the ones I figured I might want to watch. And in some cases, they're set up too. They might be a little bit more aggressive. They might be a little thinner. And I still want, I still might want to trade some of those stocks. My exact call list is the Landry list with a caveat or two. A caveat or two would mean that maybe there's a low, low price stock that I find interesting or something that doesn't completely fit the methodology that I find interesting, and that won't make it to the Landry list. But sometimes, in some cases, things that are a little unorthodox or don't quite fit it will make it. And I'll show you that in just one second. Now, I've done this years and years ago, especially in 1999 with my call list. And I had a client that did this for a while, and he did incredibly well without getting into any, any details, but he just really printed money doing this. Keep in mind that he was doing it during a very, very, very good momentum picket period in the overall market. I wouldn't recommend you rush out and do this, but if we get in a rip roaring trend, it's one thing you could do. He was, he's a bit of a day trader and he would like to list and use it as day trading. And so in a case like, this morning, I did a screen capture doing an RS sort, and this is done in telechart, but there's plenty other things you could do. out. There's a lot of free things on the internet. I think he was using CNBC app or something. Anyway, I just thought I would grab a screen grab this morning, and Barry was the only one that was in the black, and by quite a bit, quite a bit as you can see. And what he would do, and I did the same thing years ago, is I would buy the first two or three stocks in the list, first top two or three, and I would try to ride them as long as I could unless something else started moving up the momentum list, then I would maybe flip out one of those for a profit and then add another one. Now, again, I'm not recommending you rush out and do this. I just wanna show you different ways people are using it and how I've used it in the past. So here's that very, obviously it took off this morning, kind of a gap and go situation. And obviously that's why it was ranked so high based on that relative strength sort. So that's just one way of looking at things. And again, I wouldn't do that blindly right now, but if we do get in a rip roaring 
bull market and you're more aggressive type of day trader, then I think it might be something that you might want to explore. Now, sometimes I put some stocks in there that don't exactly fit the methodology, but look interesting. And the case in point is this APT. It made this big picture cup and handle, although it did kind of shoot higher first. And it also had a bit of that return to paradise look to it. And I think it was John Z in the group. I need to get, we have John's and we have Chris's. <laughs> so it gets, I get a little tripped up and who, who did what, but he pointed out that a lot of times these stocks take off, double or triple or whatever, consolidate in this big base like this and then take off again. I think he's onto something and I've seen that pattern somewhere before it it, it, it kind of reminds me of some of the dick fruit things that he's talked about such as tombstones where you have these two big peaks in there anyway so i like this stock it was a little unorthodox but if you kind of zoom in from june it looks a lot better but you can see nice persistent uptrend followed by a pullback so if you just look at that part of the chart it looked a lot better oh it was john okay john r so John R. in the group was talking about Return to Paradise. Thank you, Zach. Now, I'm not a huge fan of day trading. It's, it's kind of funny, though. The uh, guy who did the wood in my house was building the house next door, doing the wood there. And this was at the height of COVID, and he was hollering over at me across the porch, wanting to get into trading. And he's like, uh, should I be day trading? And I'm like, no, you really shouldn't be day trading. And that's not what I am and blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as it was a pause of conversation, my wife's like, he does a lot of day trading. And it's like, well, I am guilty of putting on some intraday trades. And I don't like to see it as a day trade, but more of a more of a, an intraday trade where I get in and and then I try to ride the stock as long as possible. So if it's an opening gap reversal, I get on the opening gap reversal, and I'll just draw that out real quick. And I want to try to ride it all day long. So let's say this is a daily chart, and you've got a nice stock that's pulling back. And let's just say this trend goes way back. It looks fantastic. But then you have a gap like right here, and then it begins to trade higher. Well, I might have an order in right here and a stop below the low. And if we go to an intraday chart, it might look like this, gaps down, and then begins the rally. So I get long, stop is here. Let's say I've got initial profit target up here. I'm risking, in this case, let's just say two points, just pull the, pull the number out the air. And what I'll do is when I hit this point, I'll sell half. And usually, although I'm not a huge fan of limit orders, I think it works great during the day. That way I can get, a, get about my life, go about my life. And as this rallies, this is actually a trailing stop, and it'll it'll stay two points behind. And in an ideal world, it hits that limit order, and I don't do anything because I've still got half the shares down here. Half the shares come off, half the shares are on a stop, and then just let this ride out. And I'm very proud of myself when these things, let's say, trigger in an hour or two around the open and then I don't do anything at all. And then on the close, I just go ahead and change this trailing stop to a market on close and I hold almost the entire day. I think scalping will drive you crazy. Scalping is in and out, in and out, in and out all day like the rabbit going, rabbit, I said that last week, the rabbit going for the cocaine. <laughs> Although I, I hear rabbits do like cocaine, I don't know. The rat going for the cocaine. So here's the, APG, which took off yesterday. Years ago, I worked with a trader and I was helping him find stocks. And it was kind of interesting that he was a day trader, borderline scalper, but he would look for these huge big picture patterns and then look to take his little day trade. And that way he had the big picture trend behind him. So in the case of APT, 
I know some of you guys played in the group yesterday, and if you want to chime in how you played it, that'd be great. Uh, Stewart's asking a question about that. We'll get to it in one second. And you see you have a pullback here. And one way to day trade would be, although I wouldn't recommend it for a swing trade, but one way to do it would be to put an entry right above the prior day's high and then maybe risk no more than the prior day's low, especially on a narrow range bar like this. So a wide range bar, that might be a little bit too much risk for a day trade. So that's one way of doing it. Now, I did go in yesterday. I don't think I made money on it. I was already long the stock. And I think I probably have a little guilt here. I might, I don't remember exactly what I did, Stuart, but I like the stock and it, I think it made, it probably was on this day, it made this opening lap reversal. And that might've been where I got in. I don't remember exactly. I, I can check and see. I think if anything, I probably violated some rules. But this is just one way of of playing it. Long in 1871. Yeah, that's, I think that's an okay trade. I, I don't think it's working yet, unfortunately, but there's nothing wrong with that. That looks that looks plausible to me. I, I think the stock, I think it has the potential to go back to those old highs and so far it doesn't care completely what I think. Now, the other thing that you could do with the lander list, now on this day it was pretty big, but a lot of these were airlines and you can kind of consolidate them. And I think we were looking to get long jets on that day, which never triggered, but usually it's not this big, but I like this FPRX. I don't have to go back and, and watch the service on that day and see. And again, you get them at DaveLander.com slash archives. Go to watch 618 and see if I pointed out this FPRX. I'd be interested to know. And I liked it. It was a bigger picture cup and handle. Now, you're probably thinking this guy just trades cup and handles, but I trade pullbacks and I trade bow ties and I trade, trade knockouts and all. Sometimes, especially like a a pullback and a bow tie will set up within like a cup and handle pattern. But you can see that in that pullback, the trend prior to it, it's gradually worked its way higher. Then it began to accelerate its way higher and then it began to pull back. Now you'll notice it has quite a few days in the pullback. So it didn't exactly fit the methodology. Usually eight to 10 days, I'll take them off the list. But sometimes I think they still have potential, especially if a stock has doubled or tripled in value, like this one has, before it pulls back. A stock needs to pull back two ways, one in time and two in price. Now, price is most important, but time does help too. Sometimes it needs a little time to consolidate its gains or digest its gains, so to speak. So here's the trades that are made on that particular stock in at 5.09 and knock on wood, it was a good day. Not every day is a good day. Today was a good day when we got started. <laughs> it's part of the reason why we're long, but it, uh, why we were a little late getting started, but not as uh, not as good so far. Anyway, the buy was here at 5.09 and then luckily I was blessed by hitting that initial profit target later in the day. And then I kept a little piece on and sold the remainder on the close. Now, one thing you could do is you could trail a stop intraday once you hit the initial profit target. But in this particular case, I have to go back and look at my notes, but I'm guessing it just was such a gift horse that I just wanted to put the money in my account. So that's using it for ancillary setups. Now, sometimes I'll put stocks that could set up soon on the list. So if you go back to the 7-7 list, which is published on the night of 7-6, FYI, we had this very V-E-R-I on the list. And it was in kind of a nice gradual uptrend. It, it had begun to accelerate higher and then pull back. Now on this chart, it looks like it pulled back pretty deeply, but when I was looking at it in TC, it just seemed to me like based on the incredible magnitude of the move, it needed a little bit more pullback, which it did. So. Any questions on the Landry list? I don't remember, Stuart, where I, exactly where I got in at that on that APT and why I got in. It might have been in that that opening lap. I would recommend if you're going to trade something like an opening gap reversal that you wait for something a little bit more substantial. Okay, so like let's say this very trade was 
gap down, let's say 11 or something, when you come into the market, then maybe look to play an opening gap reversal back in the direction of the trend because you've got this kind of a rubber band stretch to the downside. And then hopefully when it does reverse, begin to reverse back up, it'll give you that reversion to the mean move in the direction of the trend. S&P 500, so far making a bit of an outside day down. The volatility has been compressed as of late a little bit. We've had some narrow range bars, which suggests we're going to have a wide range bar soon. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. I did a little programming where I look at how long has it been since we had an HG seven day, meaning the day starts at one end like it did back here and then ends at the other. Might be a little bit easier to see with those funny looking charts. Let's see if I can make that happen. Yeah, a little bit easier to see with those funny looking charts. But you can see the market started here and then ended here. And for the most part, didn't look back. And this is the holy grail for an intraday trade. A little bit of a gap and go off of multi-month highs. And if you could figure out which days were very, very likely or would turn into HG seven days, meaning that starts at one end, ends at the other on a wide range bar down. You could print, you could print money, you'd own the world. And if I could do it, you'd never see my fat ass again. Now, getting back to market analysis, notice that let's take a look at the spiders. Get a true open there. Well, closer to a true open. You can see the spiders gapped higher. And so far we have an outside day down, not the end of the world, but as you can see coming off the lows nicely so far. Now you also will notice that we've been stuck in a bit of a trading range, okay? And the trading range now, the 20 day high and low, I think this is a 20 day high here. If memory serves, I think this was the last 20 day high and this is the 20 day high now, this is the 20 day low. So the range has compressed a little bit, at least over the last month. And I sure would like to see us get above these highs and while we're wishing, let's hopefully get above these highs too. Let's put the bow tie moving averages in and something I've been noodling with quite a bit and it's in the new stock charts indicators, if you want to check those out, the ACP indicators. And they should have been released yesterday, I believe. But anyway, you can see that with the 30-day EMA, we now have a nice positive slope again there. And we had a bit of a flattening here, went below it, but we never did have, or we, we haven't had any Landry lights so far since, since April. So we haven't had any downside Landry light, I should say. And if we take out, before we do that, you can see we're now in uptrend or we remain in uptrend proper order. 10 is greater than 20 and the 20 is greater than 30. And as I preach quite often, and if you watch the show from yesterday that I did for stock charts, you'll see I talked a lot about how just the proper order of these moving averages can keep you on the right side of the market. Even if there's a global pandemic, even if there's blood in the streets, even if some economist, which an economist, by the way, I looked at the definition of an economist, and it's a person that will tell you tomorrow why what he predicted yesterday did not come true today. I guess I shouldn't pick on anybody in their profession, but if you're going to come out and say the market's going to be 40% lower, it's like the, the idiot that screams on TV. You know, it's some stock was at $300 a share or whatever. It's going to be 1000 by the end of the year. And then, you know, ends up about 50 by the end of the year. <laughs> you know, nobody can make a big picture prognostication like that. If you could, then sell your house and put the money in the market, you know, and you don't own the world pretty soon. One day at a time is what I preach, and the people in my service probably sick of me hearing, uh, hearing that, saying that daily. So S&P 500, as a general statement, still doing pretty good. I sure would like to see them just kind of bust out and not look back for a while. 
Speaking of busting out and not looking back for a while, take a look at NASDAQ winning. As you can see, nice uptrend remains intact there. And if you just look at the, let's go ahead and take out the, let's clean up the, or take the moving averages out and just put in a 30. And as I've been saying quite a bit, this is something, something I've been noodling with quite a bit. And in the ACP indicators, you could actually get the Landry light above and below. If you have Metastock, my indicators are built into Metastock. I don't really use that many indicators. And as I often preach, an indicator is really not an indicator. It doesn't indicate where the price is going to go. It illustrates where the price has been. And there is some lag there. And a little lag is not necessarily a bad thing. And you can't get the lag out, although many people have tried to sell systems that claim there's no lag. That's complete BS. If it was that good, they shouldn't be selling it. But anyway, you see Landry Light all the way up, Landry Light all the way down. And now we have it in Landry Light all the way up again. So far, so good. If all you did was stay long when you had upside Landry Light above the 30, short or out of the market when you have downside Landry Light below the 30, meaning the highs are below the 30, upside lows are greater than 30. As you can see, you would do pretty damn good. And you wouldn't have to make a whole lot of prognostications. Now, keep in mind, everything works better with trend. And at some point, you get chewed up a little bit. And that's where the bow ties can kind of help you. When the bow ties are just kind of not in uptrend proper order, but not in downtrend proper order, kind of bouncing around a little bit, that helps to let you know that the market is choppy. But even during these choppy periods back here, it probably wasn't, you probably didn't want to be super long when you were below the moving average, okay? And, you know, you got above the moving average a little bit here, but use a little common sense. We're not past this prior little peak, so maybe we're just in a trading range. I don't want to sell you on the fact that it's a be-all, end-all, and it's free, by the way, so I'm not selling anything as far as Landry Light is concerned. Now, before I forget, let's take a look at the rusty, rusty bit of a bummer, okay? No downside Landry light, but we are below the 30 EMA. And again, nothing magical about it, but it does give you a good point of reference. Let's put the bow ties back in. And you can see that the bow ties are beginning to meander back and forth. That's what I was talking about earlier. So when the bow ties are chopping back and forth, then that might be a time to stay out of the market. It means the market is choppy. Now, while we're up here, let's take a look at gold. A little bit of reversal today. And talking about that, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> I'm actually long JDST at the moment, but I'm long a few gold stocks too. And I'm not long JDST as a hedge. I just saw it setting up this morning. And I took the trade. We'll see what happens there. Let me show you on an intraday chart what that might look like or what it does look like. And you could use your favorite moving average or whatever. But JDSD took off, it pulled back, and then began to take off again. And in a case like this, on an intraday trade, my stop is usually below or below plus some wiggle room. The, 30 EMA and I trail that higher and whatever that calculates out to, I project that higher for the initial profit target. But you don't want to get, you don't want to chase your tail and do a, a, a S ton of day trades because you can get in trouble quickly. Ideally, you want to have some kind of daily setup. And like today, I didn't have any opening gap reversals that were worth playing. I got a couple little opening gap and goes I'm looking at, but other than that, there's really not a whole lot going on. I got some orders working since this morning for two or three hours, however long the market's been open, and those haven't triggered yet. But anyway, be careful not to chase your own tail with day trading. We're just not wired for that many decisions. Now let's take a look at some of these sectors in here. Retail right here at all time highs, very impressive. And what's impressive here is retail and biotech and drugs to a somewhat lesser extent were old momentum, meaning that they were doing really well, first to bottom, 
and they're continuing to do well, which is kind of interesting. It was kind of cool for a while. We had old momentum and new momentum working. Market was firing on all eight cylinders, and now it's like new momentum's working, and old momentum is trying to find its way. And I'll show you what that. I'm sorry, new momentum is trying to find its way. And I'll show you what that means in just one second. For instance, old momentum still new momentum. It's biotech today, notwithstanding. I might be long a little bit of lab D, which might cause an F bomb. Drugs, we're looking pretty good today, notwithstanding, but so far hanging in there. Uptrend proper order, a longer term uptrend in place. Looking pretty darn good. Let's go back to gold stocks. Stalling out a little bit towards our old high, but if we could break past this old high in here and pull back, we should see some setups there. Silver is already broken out, coming back in a little bit in here. My only issue with the silver sector is a lot of these silver stocks, or just a few of these silver stocks, I should say, are big cap and kind of make up the whole sector. For the most part, though, sector action looking pretty good. And as you would expect, with the NASDAQ at brand new highs, hardware hanging in there, software hanging in there, a little bit of an opening gap reversal today, but beginning to rally again, right at all-time highs. Can't argue with that, right? Semiconductors hanging in there, right at all-time highs. So for the most part, most areas are looking pretty good. Some of these areas, like the transports, have been doing pretty good. They took off. Remember, just said new momentum. I mean, this was a pretty impressive rally, considering the transports are usually pretty boring. Let's take a look at that. So they went up 30% over a short period of time. And from the lows, if you want to get silly with this, they had a 50% rally. So that's pretty impressive. But now you can see they're consolidating your gains and looking a little bit more questionable in here. Like I said earlier, we were looking to get long the airlines. I know if you know me, my favorite system for the airlines is wait for them to rally and then short them. <laughs> Actually, it might've worked again this time. It's just a horrible business and they don't really trend well and just don't like them. Anyway, I think I think that's it for the sectors. You get the idea for the most part looking pretty good. What I like to do obviously is I like to let the database tell me what to do. And I'm still seeing quite a few biotechs setting up in here and a couple of technology stocks here and there and it seems like these covid related stocks still seem to be doing pretty good i think ocft might be covid related i have no idea what they do oh look at that winning all right all right well dave's in a better mood now <laughs> so, so that's looking pretty good i don't know did we show this chart, chart earlier i think we did but this one hit the initial profit target and now breaking out nicely to brand new highs all right let's open it up for individual stocks and while you guys get your stocks together, I'm going to, seems to me like this market has a bit of a bid to it. Like whenever it sells off, it just seems like it wants to come back. Let's take a look at the spiders intraday. Yeah, keep the stock picks coming. We'll analyze those. So obviously this is today's action, bit of a slide in here, but it's coming back so far. I don't want to get too caught up in the micro things, but it just seems like lately, whenever we sell off, we get a little bit of a, buying a little bit of a bid coming back into the market alt yeah that's pretty cool yeah it's pretty pretty expanded extended i should say at this point in time kind of dangerous by even big dave standards so i would be really careful on that one but it does have an s ton of volume in here so that's kind of interesting to see but yeah that'll be fun to watch but Really, 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 really dangerous stock to trade, at least at this juncture after going up a thousand or two thousand percent. But yeah, put it on your watch list for S and G's and see what happens. ALPN. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of stocks after they make such a huge gap. I would I would actually go in and find out why they gapped so much higher. Okay. What was the news event that caused that? But sometimes you get what I call a bottle rocket in a stock. A bottle rocket, to those of you who didn't grow up around rednecks and as a redneck, <laughs> is a firework that when it takes off, it's like, you think it's going to be this huge thing. And then it just goes, Meh, and just kind of fizzles out. So I call these bottle rockets. They just blast higher, and then that's it. They just fizzle, fizzle out, and that's it. So I would leave that alone, Stuart. Uh, there's still plenty of other good-looking stocks out there. 
I'm not proposing going after it, but I did get it at 726 and I'm pretty happy about it. Well, good for you, Zach. 726. Wow, look at that. Very nice. Very nice. What was it on 726? Let's see. Seven. Yeah, it's even back. This is the crazy market we're in. See, I I don't know if you brought this up in the week of charts and all, but I probably would have passed on that stock. And I know I, I did see it. I did pass on it. Now that I'm thinking about it. Just because it was too crazy. But it seems like I'm having to adjust lately and trade more and more crazy stocks. I'm even looking at some of those SPAC stocks now, which I used to completely ignore. Was it special purpose acquisition companies? And I never even heard of a SPAC stock until one of you guys brought it up in the group. And I've been taking a look at some of those, like SHLL and LCA and a few other ones, just amazing. Not that you want to rush out and trade these things, but maybe on an opening gap reversal or something like today, opening lap reversal, maybe above the high for a day trade only, but be very, very, very brave. Stuart, you brought AL. Boy, you guys are all over ALT. That's impressive. Good job on that. Wow. I wish I'd have recommended it. I would ask for lunch. <laughs> Any more stocks? Anything else you guys want to look at? GRWG. Grug. Well, it's kind of choppy. Oh, look at that. Look at that crazy move. Do a tiny Elvis again. Look at look at that move back here. It's huge. Yeah, it's kind of chopping around in here. So I would say leave it alone and then see if it breaks out, then maybe the next pullback. So just too choppy. WKHS, yeah, I've day traded that one a little bit. I don't want to make it sound like I day trade that much. Of course, you ask my wife, she'll say something else. But uh, we did have kind of like an opening gap reversal there. WK, no, this isn't one of those facts, I don't think. Look at the crazy volume on that. Just ridiculous. And this is the crazy environment we're in. People are going absolutely nuts so over these super speculative stocks. And that's part of the argument is that the retail investor jumping in these momentum stocks, these crazy momentum stocks, are beating the pants off the institutions, which is very impressive. This is a little bit too crazy to trade unless you're going to take a, an intraday trade on it, okay? And again, I'm not trying to talk you into day trading. If anything, I talk you out of it, and I need to talk myself out of doing less of it, talk myself into doing less of it, and just only trade when you have a serious serious setup in place and i forget why i took this trade maybe it's just in a pullback or something just for an intraday pop but a stock like this as crazy as it is i think you could easily come in and have this thing down 50 percent overnight and be a hurt and pop so it's just it's just too crazy even for big dave which those who weren't familiar with me i do tend to trade higher volatility stocks so yeah, I would I wouldn't trade the pullback on that one unless you're doing a day trade, maybe an opening gap reversal, a gap and go or something like that. PRLX, PRLX for Stewart again. Stewart, do you have something uh, transposed there because it's not coming up? PXRX, PLRX, is that what you're? Yeah, I like this one. It, this has been if it hasn't been in a Landry list, it it it. I write it down every day, and then I look at the volume on this. If you give me give me a second, let me get the spread on that for you. Yeah, you've got you've got a one point spread right now. And I know I, I recently I want to kick myself in the butt. <laughs> I've been hanging out with a scalper too much, and um, he's kind of got me sucked into some of these intraday trades. And someday I love him for that. Someday I hate him. But. Maybe I've been looking at the spreads too much, and I did miss an, an IPO recently for FOUR because the spread was a little wide on that. But this thing is too thin. I hear you, though. It's a first deep retracement. I don't know if you have the IPO course or not. But if not, you've been a client long enough to where you should get it soon through being a member, through the uh, member bonuses. But, yeah, I hear you. It's a first deep retracement. But... Just a crazy, crazy spread on this thing. Now, keep in mind, and this is where it gets a little tricky, but sometimes in these 
IPOs that are thin, the volume begins to pick up and the, and the, and the spread begins to tighten. So this one's on my watch list, but it's still a little thin. Thoughts on ADCT, credit to John Ross, as he brought it up in the group. Why do I know this stock? Yeah, it looks good. Uh, thin, though. Thin. That's why I know it, because uh, it's thin. Yeah, I think it looks fantastic. Uh, a little crazy, but hey, you know what? This is the environment we live in. But check the spread on that. You've got accelerated uptrend, nice deep pullback. Could actually be even deeper, believe it or not. So yeah, kudos to John on that one. High five. I mean, high five, but thin. So we'll have to watch the spread and see. This one would definitely come up or has been coming up. The reason I said, why do I know it is because it's been coming up in my IPO scans nightly. That and that PLRX and some of these other ones that are just a little bit on the thin side. I've been a little gun shy on these thinning RIPOs. As one of you guys pointed out, it might have been John again. Sometimes it's a Hotel California stock. You can't get out. You can check in, but you can never leave. I know that's not exactly the right words. Yeah, MNKD has been on a Landry list forever. I don't know if it's still on a Landry list. I may have taken it off last night. It's a little unorthodox in that it's cheap and a little wild and crazy, but it's not bad. It did kind of take off. It's got a, quite a few days of the pullback now, but I still think it has potential. I, I still think it's one that's that's worth watching. I've been watching it. Even though it's a little wild and crazy, I think it's uh, kind of an interesting stock. Maybe somewhere between where it is and two, maybe like 190 or so, and then a stop maybe down around 160 or even lower. You know, I, you know just keep in mind, if you're trading a cheap biotech like this, be prepared to come in and lose half your money overnight that you put up. So keep your position size small. When I'm trading something like this or a cheapy stock, I'll go in. Yeah, 196, Stuart, that's fine. Absolutely. When I'm trading a cheapy stock like this, I'll trade. I don't want to lose 2% of my account on it. So maybe I'll go up to 1%. So let's just say. Oops, hang on, I gotta put a stop in. So let's see what the 196, 196 is plausible. In fact, ironically, that's right where I drew that line. So let's say 196 and let's say 155, let's say 96. I know it sounds crazy, right? So that's 41 cents. Yeah, 20, about 2,500 shares on a 100K account, risking 1%. And that's plenty. That's plenty, 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 plenty. The thing runs 10 points. You made $25,000. That's plenty. I'm still at 1%. Hope to raise to 2% once I know what I'm doing. Well, take your time, Stuart. And, uh, you know, it's a guy in a group, I think, at a quarter percent or half percent, just wrapping his head around the methodology. And he's been doing incredibly well, but he's also very disciplined. Even though he's done so well, he's just kind of going from a quarter percent to a half percent. And, Take your time and bump along. Go through the members' courses. Go through the money management, especially where I talk about getting to 2% max on the risk. And what you do there is, let's say you're at a half percent, well, then bump it up to maybe three quarters of a percent. And once you're successful at three quarters, then bump to one. Don't be at a half percent, jump to 2%, lose two or three times in a row, and now you're down 6% on your account and then go back to a half percent and then win three times in a row, you could easily end up in a downward spiral. So that's great that you're at 1%, slowly work your way higher to 2% if you're comfortable with that. There's nothing wrong with taking it easy, okay? 1M still looks good to me. Yeah, I still have some 1M. This was a recommendation, I don't remember, I, I don't know if this was an official recommendation we stopped out or I bought it and stopped out for whatever reason. But I have it in one of my accounts, and it's actually done quite well, knock on wood. It's not set up now, though, even though I'd like to say, market your house and put all the money into it. It's the best of the stock I've ever seen. But no, it's, it's looking interesting, but not as a new setup. So if it breaks out, for me, it would have to break out to new highs and then pull back again. So yeah, I'm not sure how I ended up playing that one and why I have half the shares on. You know, it'll be an interesting... Still like to take the IPO course. Yeah, well, you're going to get it eventually. Uh, just stay a member, and you seem like you're in for the long haul. So that's the idea. As long as you're a member, eventually you'll get everything that is, the, is a premium on the back end. 
one M, you took it off the list a while back. Okay, so that's one that was on the list, but I don't know if I made an official setup or not, but I personally took the trade. So that's kind of an example of an ancillary setup, and there might have been something else I liked better at the time for an official recommendation. I probably triggered in somewhere in here and stopped out somewhere in here. You know, it's one advantage of having multiple accounts. I think by the time I got around to selling in the second account, it was already off its lows. And you know, sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a disadvantage too. So, like a, geez, I hope I bought. See, I'll, I'll tell you a disadvantage. I don't know if I've got to vary in both accounts today, both of the big accounts. LMND on its first pullback. LMND. Okay. Lemonade. <laughs> Oh, lemonade, that cool, refreshing drink. Elvis, you want some lemonade? Lemonade, that cool, refreshing drink. Anybody remember that? Eddie Murphy, I think. Yeah, this might be a little too crazy, even by Big Dave standards. Anybody know what the hell they do? They sell lemonade? <laughs> lemonade, that cool, refreshing drink. Um, It's like I almost want to say it needs a deeper pullback. It's just too crazy. I I, I I can't go after it. I can't touch it. I would leave it alone. You know, maybe if it does some opening gap reversal or something, because it does have a S ton of volume, so that's good. Where would you find to the long entry over 80? Yeah, I mean, it's just too crazy. I hear you, though, but yeah, I just leave it alone, see what happens, but that's just too nuts. VMD have a buy order at 1465. Yeah, it's a good looking stock. It's it's had quite the run, but it did make a really deep pullback. So I like that. So yeah, I can't fault you on that, Stuart. I think it looks pretty good. And the TSX, the Toronto version. It's an insurance company. Strange name for an insurance company. Oh wow. Lemonade. Lemonade insurance. Well, as usual, I'd like to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. And I hope to see all you guys and girls again next week. Everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, all the guys and girls in the Facebook group, I'll see you guys in a few minutes. Thank you so much.